Hello again, everyone. Uh, we are up and running in this second edition of WFS Live. And a shout out to the audience who are already with us, the keen ones amongst you. It's great to have you with us. And thank you for your interaction in that last session uh, as well with Jürgen and Jacques Henri and Sharon Thorne. Uh, and we'd like you to continue doing so. And in fact, not just interacting with us here on the Swap Car platform with your questions and lots of activity in the chat section as well, but also on social media. Um, if you want to spread the word about what we're doing, uh, the hashtag WFS Live on Twitter. We are at WF Summit and on Instagram at World Football Summit. Uh, so on we go. And we're talking about gender equality uh, in sport in our next panel. Um, the fight for gender equality, I guess, is nothing new. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, from Babe Didrikson, who competed alongside male golfers on the PGA Tour, uh, to Billie Jean King, of course, who uh, beat Bobby Riggs in tennis's Battle of the Sexes, to Megan Rapinoe and the rest of the US women's national team, football world champions, of course, and in this context, more importantly, campaigners for equal pay for male and female players, something that is now being done by the football associations of England, Brazil, Australia, Norway, and New Zealand, and I'm sure that more and more will follow. Uh, that is one of the most recent examples of norms being broken to lead football towards a more fair and equal proposition, placing equality and diversity at the heart of the matter. Women's football very much leading the way. Uh, and if it's properly supported, one well, more positive change will follow in the years to come, I am absolutely sure. Uh, this panel is in collaboration with Common Goal. So let's introduce our speakers now. Uh, Commissioner at the National Women's Soccer League, uh, Lisa Baird, the chair at the Women in Football, Ebru Coxal, uh, FIFA Council member representing Conmebol, uh, Maria Son Munoz, and to to moderate this roundtable, a co-founder and executive director at uh, Soccer Without Borders, Mary McVeigh Connor. Uh, Mary, this should be a fascinating panel. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here at, at the World Football Summit Live. Uh, my name is Mary Connor. I'm here, um, as David mentioned, in my capacity as executive director, co-founder of Soccer Without Borders. Um, which is an organization that uses soccer as a football, as a vehicle for positive change with a particular focus on social inclusion and advancing gender equality. So every day I get to see firsthand the power that football has as a sport and as an industry and as a cultural phenomenon with the power to shape the world. Um, and so I have the great pleasure of speaking here today with the panelists about what transformations they're seeing when it comes to advancing gender equality through football uh, maybe what they predict and what they envision for the future. Um, so I'm, I'm reminded as we think about these conversations that a more equitable and diverse football is not automatic. Um, with it, we live in, an, in a world that is inequitable and that has been certainly laid bare by the coronavirus and how it's, it's disproportionately affecting women and girls. Um, so how do we ensure that football is an industry that shapes that itself shapes the world to be more equitable and, it, and itself reflects that um, rather than simply mirroring, mirroring the world as it is. Um, so there's no better group of panelists to give us insight into this than women who are, are being the change they wanna see in the world. Um, so I'm, you've read their bios, they actually need no introduction. I will give very brief introductions, but I'm gonna start with, with you, Ever. the first question. Um, you've been a football executive, a general manager, General Secretary of the Turkish Football Association. You've led from within the football industry, and now your organization, Women in Football, is focused on making leadership more gender inclusive. So tell us about Women in Football and a bit about the opportunity of embracing this approach right now. Sure. Thank you, Mary. Um, wonderful to be on the panel together with two great leaders, Lisa and Sol. Uh, well, Women in Football was founded 12 years ago uh, by a group of journalists uh, who were feeling very left out and lonely uh, doing the match day reporting at the stadiums or on television. And 12 years later today, we have 4,500 members, um, uh, mostly women, but some male allies who are members as well. And uh, about 20% of our membership base is from outside the UK. I joined the organization five years ago and became chairperson two years ago. And what we are trying to do is, uh, first of all, connect people. And uh, women are usually working in their little silos in every single possible job in the game. 
and um, to hear about other op positions and other women in other parts of the world has been a wonderful way to uh, understand that they're not alone in what they're going through. And, and that's usually difficulties, of course, needless to say. Um, I came into football 20 years ago as a result of discrimination from finance industry, actually. I'm originally an investment banker, and um, the fund that I was working for invested in Galatasaray. I had just delivered my second child, and uh, my contract was terminated because I had two very young children. And then, luckily, Galatasaray president invited me over as an interim uh, CFO, and I loved it so much, I ended up staying for the last uh, 20 years in the industry. It's become much more inclusive than what it was 20 years ago, but we still have a lot of work to do. And the recent survey that we have published, along with our rebranding um, about a month and a half ago, uh, once again shows that discrimination still exists. 66% of the women surveyed uh, said that they either experienced or witnessed uh, discrimination. And the more worrying part is only 12% chose to report it. So the gap is still huge. Women don't feel confident, comfortable in their workplaces. They don't feel included and they don't think it's safe to speak up. So there's definitely uh, more, much more work to do to build inclusive organizations. But the future is very hopeful. Um, the survey also revealed that uh, more than 75% of the women said that uh, they felt supported by their colleagues and their organization and that they thought the future was bright. So though we still have quite a bit, bit of more work to do, I think um, those of us who were persevering over the years managed to open many doors for the others to follow us. And I can confidently say that as women in football, we are helping to build this talent pool and uh, we have been a great source of uh, upskilling work through our leadership courses and we are working with all the stakeholders in both um, English football as well as European football to uh, help build more inclusive organizations. Great. Well, speaking of, of people who are opening doors, I want to I want to turn to you, Maria Sol. Um, you represent Common Bowl and uh, are the first woman member to represent Common Bowl to the FIFA Council. And when it comes to Common Bowl, it's, it's impossible to think about football without thinking about Argentina and Brazil. Um, but recently, those, those two federations have been top of mind for another reason with the women's teams, you know, organizing, demanding new policies for equal pay, leagues, equal conditions. Um, so what are, what are you seeing in your, in your role in, in football governance? And where do you see this, this transformation happening? How do, you, how do we keep that momentum going? What are you excited about? Thank you, Mary. I'm so happy and thrilled to be joining this panel with you. And uh, well, about your question, uh, first of all, I'd like to share the words of the FIFA president, Gianni Infantino. He said, I believe we have to work, we have work to do in making football truly global. Our key mission is to truly globalize, popularize, and democratize football for the benefit of the entire world. So this gives us uh, an, a very clear idea of what are FIFA's goals uh, in using football as the powerful tool it is to, to get more people connected and involved not only in the game, but in society and governance. And about South America, you just mentioned two very big names in football, which are Brazil and Argentina. Brazil uh, made a groundbreaking statement by telling the world we're, we're paying the same, the same to women's national football team and men's national football team. And about Argentina, this is something I am really proud to share with you because Argentina is a, a pioneer they became the first member association of FIFA. FIFA has 211 member associations, and Argentina is the first one to create a department of equity and gender. Now, what, what is this uh, department? Um, it's it's uh, uh, an area of the, the Argentinian Football Association, AFA, 
<laughs> and uh, they have a, a vision which is to educate and empower by raising participation, the development and growth on and off the pitch. They have settled the, their values as inclusion, integrity, unity, and equality. And they want to give women a fundamental role in football by generating the correct spaces and policies to allow them to grow in their areas, whether it, uh, they work as uh, players or referees, they are leaders, they're fans. And the purpose is to create and implement a protocol of gender equality and make people conscious of the need to empower in, uh, people in vulnerable conditions. Um, people in vulnerable conditions can be uh, many groups of people, such as women, children, teenagers, people from indigenous communities, people that uh, have different capacities and needs. And uh, they want to make uh, women's football more professional. Argentina is working very strongly and doing very well in, in, this, in this matter. And they also want to act against violence because they know this is a very huge problem we have, not only in the region, but worldwide. But this is an example being settled from South America. Uh, AFA also created the Observatory of Equity and Gender in Football. And the main goal of this, of this is to watch the progress make, being made nationally. They, they have a, a, a number of tasks uh, which are to observe and register all actions in football where women take an active part in. And they also want to teach, train, and advise journalists and communicators in general who are interested in topics related to the fight against violence. And they want to articulate actions to foment football as a tool for inclusion. Finally, another goal they have settled is uh, to train people working at the clubs. Uh, all kinds of, of, uh, of people working there. I mean, coming from the directive board to staff members, players, and also fans, of course, in equity and gender, because they believe education and prevention are uh, the best tools to create awareness of this matter. And they have achieved a lot as a, as a men's, in, in men's football, and they, want, they believe it's time for women to do it too. As I was saying, on and off the pitch, not only as players, as leaders and everything involved in football. This uh, initiative was uh, very well uh, congratulated by FIFA because I was, as I was saying, it, they are pioneers. And I, I think it is a great example that other federations should take too. Great. Well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring Lisa into this conversation now, but then I hope, you know, we're starting to hear the, what's happening within the, the industry and within leadership, what's happening within governance and federations. So we'd be remiss if we didn't also talk about that club level and the, and the league level and, and where this transformation is happening there. And Lisa, you run the National Women's Soccer League, the NWSL. Um, I, I have to say I'm, I'm in awe of, of what has been built with the NWSL. I'm a former player in the WUSA and, and uh, my team you know, folded when the WSA folded in 2003. And so it's just so exciting to see that, you know, eight seasons under your belt and uh, what is, what's happening for the future. Um, and so I was hoping if we could first start with sort of the journey, and I know you haven't been at the helm the entire time, but what do you see as those key moments that have sort of enabled the NWSL to, to, um, you know, bring it to this to this point in a market that three times has been tried before? Well, buenos dias. Mi español no es muy bueno, so thank you for everybody for speaking in English. Um, uh, I've only been with the National Women's Soccer League for a little under a year, about eight months. Um, I joined March 10th. I then shut the league down on March 12th, along with the rest of the sports industry. It was a very sobering, 24 hours for the entire industry as every sport um, shut down immediately. I think it was led by the National Basketball Association, but I think the sports industry understood more than anybody how what the sobering realization of the pandemic would be. So my remarks are a bit short uh, because my time frame has been short to accomplish what we needed to do. Um, um, and I'll, I'll get to the thing. Since I've joined, um, we had to create uh, what we call the game plan to get back to play. What was immediately apparent is that 
uh, all leagues, federations, individual ones, they had to really create their own playbook. Um, there was nothing that allowed us to um, do what we needed to do in the pandemic. And of course, the safety of our players and staff was foremost. So we pulled together all of the medical protocols necessary, and they were quite extensive. It was um, it was very, very serious work. And it took us about um, probably eight weeks to actually pull together the medical protocols, and there was no basis. Along the way, we had to um, not only figure out a way to get our players back to preseason safely, but contemplate what it would look like to create a competition in the middle of the pandemic. We chose uh, initially for safety reasons to do the first part of our season in a bubble. Um, we also changed the competition format to a, a Olympic style knockout tournament because the Olympics had gone away, which was um, very sad for all of us who are Olympic fans, but we created a, a, a different competition. We announced two media broadcast partners, one domestic and one global. We brought on three national sponsors um, because in order to do this, you know what? We have to pay our way. We are not a we are not a federation. We need to create the revenue that um, had to do it. It was a big challenge for us because we couldn't have fans in the stadiums, and we chose not to do that early on. So ticket revenue was not a possibility. Um, we were. I worked very closely with our players' association, and we reached an agreement early on to uh, cover their compensation for the entire year which was only made possible through the ability for us to um, sign national sponsors. All the players, um, 230 players signed on to this in the National Women's Soccer League. They're not the Federation players, but there are uh, employees um, as a single entity. Coming back from that, um, we actually uh, achieved record high TV ratings um, for the National Women's Soccer League versus this year ago, but also I think Frankly, we took everybody by surprise in the United States sports industry because we were the first league to actually return to competition. Um, it was something that um, I say, you know, with a lot of humor, I kept having to remind people that no, we were the first league back, but that's okay. We use our humor, but we, I think, surprised everyone with the type of ratings that we did they were um, very, very good, not only for us, but relative to other types of leagues. After that, um, we came back. We were looking at what to do because our players wanted to play more games and we wanted to be able to have the um, national spotlight. So we swiftly pivoted in two to three weeks. We were offered um, broadcast windows on CBS um, that were open and we were able to swiftly pivot again with our players and we created a home and away situation. We then played a full series. Um, and again, we were able to post record, not only domestic ratings, but international ratings. So in our last globally streamed game on Twitch, um, I think we reached a million viewers, live viewers, which is um, frankly, if you look at Twitch, which is mostly about esports and competition, it's not mostly about live sports yet, but it's a tremendous uh, streaming service. Um, we were able to uh, achieve like a top 20, uh, top 20, 25 status in terms of live views, concurrent views. And that competes with what Twitch was invented for with the esports. You were, we were up there with um, some of the biggest esports legs in terms of our viewing. And it just shows to me um, how powerful the ge women's game is. And let's talk about that for a minute. We want equality. We want diversity. That's what we stand for. We are a league about empowerment. But first and foremost, people have to recognize that the product is great. The players are fantastic. And it's my job as the commissioner to make sure that I'm delivering the revenue, the competition, the safety, and the media deals. Because to this day, only 4% of uh, all media is dedicated to women's sports. So um, I think our job is to tell the story, to get it exposed, to make sure that we're doing what we need to do to bring, um, you know, frankly, revenue to the table because th this is a business um, like many others. And we have to 
achieve the things that we need to do to um, make sure it's worthwhile for broadcasters to air the games, for sponsors to sponsor them, and then, of course, to ensure that we are growing compensation along the way. So it's been a, a full year. We're not done yet. Um, we have welcomed uh, one expansion team that got quite a bit of exposure in the United States because many, many big names, Billie Jean King, uh, Natalie Portman, um, uh, America Ferrara, um, a lot of big names got behind it. And we were able to announce a, um, a, a new expansion team in Los Angeles. And uh, it's been an exciting time. I just came back from that press conference. They will be playing in beautiful Bank of California Stadium in Los Angeles, which is which is frankly one of the most breathtaking stadiums I've, I've ever seen in the US. So we've got a lot of uh, work ahead of us. I don't want to underestimate it at all, but um, you know, I think it goes towards our owners and our players. They're the ones that get the credit at the National Women's Soccer League. Yeah. And Angel City FC, for those who haven't heard the news, um, definitely check it out and look it up, the team that, that Lisa's speaking about. Now, Ebru, I know that when, when we spoke ahead of this, you also spoke about the business opportunity of women's football and the transformation that is that is happening there and how women leaders can really bring that to fruition. So I was wondering if you could speak to kind of pick up where Lisa left off and uh, speak to what you see coming down the pike in terms of in terms of that sure. growing the game. Um Lisa, my heart is with you to come into a new job that is very challenging at this time is not an easy task and you've done a wonderful job. I think what's been really frustrating, especially during the pandemic, is um, not being given equal opportunity for women's football and girls football. So although we understand the complexities about medical protocols and testing and, um, you know, expenses and the fact that girls and uh, grassroots teams are not playing in very high level um, uh, in, uh, uh, stadiums or, or training grounds. We understand all those difficulties, but it's so difficult to explain to an eight year old girl why she cannot play and her nine year old brother or seven year old neighbor who's a boy is able to play. So I think the whole world has been um, shaken by the pandemic, obviously, but uh, in all women's sports, there has been uh, many more left behind, unfortunately. And this is, I see it as a bit of a short-sighted approach. And there is no industry in the world, even if you're making a real estate investment or you know, building a factory, there's no investment that starts paying back on day one. Right. That's the uh, idea of a return on investment. So if you want to have an ROI, first you need to do the investment. Um, and many actually franchise owners in Europe and in US have understood the merits of this. Right. You first need to invest and then it is a virtuous cycle building upwards. So you invest, build the right infrastructure, bring in not volunteers, but, um, you know, a good team uh, of professionals and then sponsors start pouring in, media starts coming in, broadcasting happens, and it doesn't have to be in the traditional way, as Lisa was saying and fans start coming in. We also know that women's football is still being watched predominantly by male fans. So we still have a lot of work to do on bringing uh, eyeballs and um, people into the stadiums for women's football as well. Uh, but we are seeing so many brands that are jumping on this opportunity because it's a blank white page. And um, on, on one hand, men's football sometimes can be extremely crowded in terms of the sponsor's uh, ability to activate those sponsorship rights and the message that they are giving. But women's football is still representing predominantly all the values that football was initially meant to be, right? And it's more family values. It's more about competition and um, you know technical abilities on the pitch and brands like you know Barclays, Visa, Nike, um, I guess Budweiser in the US as well, 
Many of them saw this significant opportunity and are benefiting from the first comers advantage and actually will be interviewing the global head of sponsorships for visa on Thursday. Um, and as women in football, we were the category partners for the best women's football initiative and their investment as visa into women's football this year has been really, really commendable. So I think um, the best recommendation that I can give to to brands and also investors is if I had a dollar, I would now put it into women's football. Um, yes, maybe the, the amounts are much smaller, but the exponential growth that is going to happen in the next five to 10 years is definitely not to be missed. So I want to I want to tie that um, thinking we have a question from the audience and I'm going to try to 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 weave it in. So thank you, Imani, from for sharing your question. Um, this is this is forward looking, right? So this momentum is happening within leagues, within sponsorship, within uh, the industry, but also it follows from sound policies and sometimes and there are aspects of policy that we can sort of mandate equitable practices. We saw a new policy uh, starting to emerge last this week, actually, or last week um, with maternity leave policy, which will enable uh, women's players to be able to keep their contracts when uh, they go on maternity leave. So Sol, I'd like to turn this question to you. We, we've talked a lot about what got us to this point and this moment we're in. What do you see as some of the next milestones as we start to embed gender equality and equitable opportunities in, into this pathway. What are, what are the next milestones that we, that we wanna see that you're looking for? Well, I believe the next milestone would be to see more women in uh, decision-making uh, positions, uh, more women in uh, football's governance. Uh, you, were, you just said uh, something that's very important about opportunities give, uh, that are given. And that's exactly what happened to me. The opportunity was given to be part of the FIFA Council as a woman when, when uh, FIFA demanded all the confederations to have within their representatives in the council at least one woman. And uh, only one, one of us had done it before, uh, before this was an imposition. And uh, that's uh, Lydian Sequeira from, from the confederation in Africa. So uh, she, she was a groundbreaking uh, woman who, who got there before this was an imposition, but this was an opportunity g given from the main governing body uh, in football, FIFA. And from there, I think we can expect a lot of uh, women getting involved. I see, I, I see now more women wanting to get involved. I think just a few years before, women thought uh, this was something that was just uh, reserved for men. Uh, no woman was part of, uh, or almost no, no woman was part of a governing body. And today that's very different. I can tell you in my country, a few years ago, you didn't see a single woman who was the president of a club, of a first division club. And today we have uh, four women in, uh, in this position. So you see the growth of a uh, number of, of women getting involved, wanting to get involved, wanting to learn about governance, wanting to... To, to from the academia uh, having a, a profession uh, that can lead them to a, a position in a governing body in football or in, in, in other sports as well. But as our football is our, our goal here and uh, our main uh, preoccupation, uh, that's what we talk about. So um, as I was saying, what I see in the future is more women getting involved and hopefully Soon we'll see women uh, ahead of confederations and why not FIFA? I mean, we already have a general secretary for the first time. And uh, maybe uh, all of us can follow that example and try to get there too and even higher. Right. So representation in, in these leadership roles as sort of milestones you're, you're looking for. Lisa or Ebru, are there, are there other milestones when you think about the journey that's gotten us here? and the opportunity that you just described going forward, what are some of those next milestones that, that you're gonna look for that indicate, yes, we're, we're still marching in the right direction towards this more equitable football and this transformation that's happening? Lisa, if I may just say a, say a few things. 
I think um, quotas and these kinds of representations are extremely helpful to, to make the change happen faster. And um, we really wish that it becomes mandatory for all the 211 member associations and they in turn make it mandatory to all the clubs within their constituencies to have at least one woman. Now it's a best practice or a recommendation. So that demand, so we're doing a lot to push the talent pool up and encourage them and give them the confidence to try for these positions. As Sol said, everyone thought until now it was a uh, you know men's place. I was the first woman to ever run for office at European Club Association back in 2010. At the time, nobody thought that I would you know, win the election, but I did. But after me, it took nine more years for ECA to have another woman on its board. And if that happens, then we are anomalies. We're not, you know, normalized, uh, you know, part of the society. And initially, um, the recruiters and the decision makers don't really know where to look. So sometimes what happens is they just bring in people who are, you know, familiar, who are known to them, but they're not necessarily part of the inner circle and part of the culture. And that's something we need to break as well. So it's not just enough to create these positions and get the women in there, but we need to make sure that the senior leadership includes them and allows them to contribute. And that's when we really achieve the board diversity and the effective performance of boards and senior management. And for us, the next steps and the transformation and the normalization will come with that. And hopefully in 10 years, we won't have to exist because there's no more an issue about equality. Well said, well said, <laughs> both of you. I, you know, look, I, I don't know if it's quotas. I do think that, you know, the United States in particular has been very lucky to have had Title IX um, passed as legislation, uh, you know, I forget how many years ago it is now, 30, 35, 40. And you see, the benefit, yeah, you see the benefit of that type of legislation. By the way, it wasn't, I, I remind people, it wasn't passed to benefit sports. It was actually passed for a different reason, which was to benefit academics. Um, and, and um, but the, 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 the huge beneficiary was that. So I do, I do see that in certain cases to get things started, um, it, it, it is helpful. Um, I, I also think that, you know, if you start to look at, I see the, the, what I'll call the unfreezing that I see happening in the way people think about it is um, success derives success. Right. And, and if we are open to looking for success, in new places, particularly women leaders from other industries. And um, then I think that that is another good way outside of quotas to make sure that we're getting the best thinking and the best leadership in. I mean, I've always been one to recruit people from different industries, industries that might have be further ahead. Um, I'm always really anxious to talk to our sponsors. If you look, if you talk, if, if people looked at sponsorship, for instance, you're going to find that women are some of the top decision makers at the sponsors because women are important buyers. You know, look at, look at, you know, the head CMO of Visa, the CMO of American Express, uh, all these multinational companies, they're women. And so if your customers are women and your leaders or women, you should be looking to embrace that and bring that in if you're the, the soccer world, because that's where success is, is coming from. So I do think that legislation and, and quotas can play a role, particularly in countries that <clears throat> need to come a little quicker. But I also think that we should be equally talking about how women are driving success in sports. That's happening now. We don't have to say, hey, put us there because we're a woman. Put us there because we're successful. And that's a new part of the conversation that I think we should all be incredibly proud of. 
and I, 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 I would be remiss if we didn't take the conversation about the future to the next generation and to the, the youth level and the grassroots level. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would love to ask what you all are seeing, and maybe I'll start, Ebru, we have, we have just 10 minutes, so maybe I'll start with you. I know we spoke a little bit about the grassroots. What are the, what are the milestones or transformations you're seeing there that you're excited about that you think are going to feed into this movement that's happening from the top down? in governance, in leadership, in industry? What, what can the grassroots build up from to sort of meet this same wave and, and all be a part of the, the momentum going forward? Two years ago, as Women in Football, we launched an inaugural campaign called What If? And individuals and organizations came in with pledges. And the FA had one of the best pledges that we are really proud of to bring um, football for girls to every single school in the UK. So that is a huge commitment and it is happening. So everything starts with obviously the participation and the intent. And then we have sponsors coming in to make sure that um, the grassroots football is played at uh, more, you know, better infrastructure with good coaches and that girls are encouraged to stay in the game. I mean, that's how we ensure the pipeline. On the professional side and the talent side, of course, we are seeing many, many more um, university students or high school students being interested in sports. I'm getting approached by so many people saying, we would love to be involved in football or sports. How do we get in? And it football and, and sports in general is starting to look more welcoming for women and we will see the young generation much more interested to work in it as an industry i used to look around 20 years ago every single room i entered i was the only woman up till maybe five six years ago now i'm so happy to see other women you know uh, around me and Another extremely important uh, responsibility for us is to tell those stories, tell the stories that Lisa was saying about all the success stories and the role models and the great work that everybody is doing. And last week in our leadership course, um, the last day is about storytelling and the stories we heard from every single participant. My God. I was in tears half of the time. So these stories need to be told so that more women get in the game and uh, make it a more equal place and performing much better as well. And you, and you talk about <clears throat> Title IX and these policies and this effort in the UK. But Sol, I, I want to go to you in, in within Commable. Uh, you know, there, there are still strides to be made in terms of bringing in, in many countries. I know when, when I was young, I had I played on boys teams growing up because at that time there were no girls teams in my age groups. And that is still the case in many countries where there might be leagues up and down the bracket from when boys are eight, nine, ten. And on the girls side, you know, the first team is under 15, under 18. How do we how do we what are the challenges that you see there within your region and and how can we address those? Well, in South America, Comebol had the goal of increasing the number of uh, female players, registered female players, and I think Comebol has done a great work there since uh, 2016 uh, with the new administration. The number of registered players has increased in 400 percent and uh, Comebol has a, a very good initiative, which is the Fiesta Sudamericana de la Juventud. It, it is a, a, a competition, a friendly competition, uh, with uh, categories starting at uh, under under 13, I think it is. And um, they bring uh, girls and boys from uh, all around South America, their teams, uh, to compete there. And it's really, as, as, as the name says, a fiesta, a party, a football party for young kids to play, to have the, that chance to see how a competition goes. And Comebol believes that increasing the competition increases the level of uh, football in South America and increases the opportunities to boys and girls. 
And uh, Ebert said a while ago that women's football is uh, like a blank white page. So this is a huge opportunity we have. The potential is infinite, I believe. In South America, you know the kind, the kind of players <laughs> we, we, we give to the world. And uh, boys and girls get these opportunities, and uh, especially girls uh, who need that space. Because everything starts with participation, just as ever said as well uh, a while ago. Uh, we do believe that we need to give those opportunities, and I think we are doing a great job in that matter. Great. Well, so we have we have just two minutes left, and I I warned each of you about this. We want to give the audience something to take with them into the rest of World Football Summit Live, <clears throat> and I would love for each of you to share just in, you know. 20 seconds or less, sort of a, a parting phrase, a parting thought for those to take with them. Um, Lisa, could we start with you? Oh, uh, you know what, it, it, was, it was, I'm gonna borrow from a, a ESPN journalist that um, said it better than I did. Her name is Sarah Spain and she was on ESPN Sports Center. And it was, uh, it was again about, we had, um, most of the other big properties in the United States, their TV ratings were down this year. And there were two among three where ratings climbed. Um, the WNBA climbed and we grew our ratings 500% over a year ago. And she said it best. And I think it is, she said, bet on women. Bet on women. We're delivering the audience. We're, we're making the game exciting. People are players, are global, iconic superstars. Women are buying teams. Um, they're general managers. And I think it's going to something that I'm seeing changing, which is if you talked about, you know, a lot of people used to talk about men to 18 to 34. That was the hard audience to reach. I think it's women. I think women are the hard audience to reach now because they're they're working, they're um, doing their thing, and you know what reaches them? Women's sports, and we're influencers. Our our players are are influencers. So I would say bet on women. All right. Well, we I think I think this is going to switch us off right at right at the mark. So, um, Ever, do you have a, a final phrase, five literally, seconds. a quote to Mine take with us? Five yeah. seconds. And I'm going to call on the male allies. We as women are already convinced anyways, but we can't do it without the support of our male allies. Therefore, you know, whoever is in your little circle or big circle, do, do help the women to thrive and um, take the opportunities. All right. Well, thank you all for being with us today and enjoy the rest of the World Football Summit. Male ally right here, right here. Hey, Bruce, yes. you need me? I'm yes, right yes, here. Yes. And I'm sure that many others, many others as well. Um, listen, th that was a fascinating discussion. Thank you, first of all, to Mary for, for chairing it so expertly. My goodness, I, I mean, if you, if you want to see my notes here, I, I can barely read them myself, but I'm going to try and summarize very, very briefly. Um, I'm going to actually start, uh, Abru, talking about her frustration, especially during the, the, the pandemic of, of maybe not being given equal opportunities, especially young girls, many more sort of left behind in terms of women's sport. And that there's work to do to bring the eyeballs, to bring people back to stadiums, to women's football, but that the brands are kind of taking the lead here. And you're right to mention the likes of Visa, who I know you'll be speaking to on Friday and, and discussing what they're doing uh, with Adrian Farina from, from Visa and, and incredible work, things like the second half, which is a brilliant uh, initiative. I remember we heard about that last time around here at, at WSL, uh, WFS Live. And then hearing about the 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 interesting sort of um, I suppose developments that you that maybe not many people have heard about. Um, Maria Sol talking about the Department of Equity and Gender created um, by by AFA by the Argentine Football Association, which which is great. And I didn't know this, uh, Lisa, about the um, NWSL being in the top twenty or twenty five on Twitch, which is huge. Why are people not talking about this? That's, that's such an important demographic to try and attract. Uh, and then seeing the milestones that could come in the future. So more women in influential positions, of course, given more opportunities, head of confederations, maybe even head of FIFA. We're talking of the general secretary. We will have Fatma Samora here at WFS Live on the final day to close uh, officially. Um, Every saying about quotas being helpful. Uh, Lisa saying about recruiting from different industries who maybe are ahead in this journey. And then some some awesome, um, just some sentiments towards the end there. Uh, Maria Sol again, so 400% increase uh, in the number of registered female players with Gomebol, which is such a result. It's, it's just brilliant. And, and then the final uh, message there, bet on women. 
and, and get the male allies on board as well. So lots of positive messages, lots of things that, again, are actionable. We're on this journey and more ground can be made up, certainly in the years to come. So fantastic panel, as always. Thank you so much, Mary, Lisa, uh, Abra, and Maria Sol. Uh, so uh, that's two down, four to go here on WFS Live Day 1. And we're right back in a couple of minutes' time uh, with a, uh, a roundtable, which is brought to you in partnership with Santander. More than an athlete raising a voice for the community. We'll see you very shortly indeed.